All right, so this week I have a bit of a blast in the past because my friend Lauren today, who is with us in Los Angeles, California, which looks spectacular, um, and I used to live in for five years, we crossed paths years ago when we both worked for hotels, and Lauren specializes in events and weddings, and she's done all kinds of amazing ones, um, not just in California, but beyond, and is also an entrepreneur. So you'll have to correct me on this before we jump right in, but you had uh, my weddings or my hotel weddings website, which I think then translated into weddings programs or videos, kind of how-tos. And then recently, the exciting launch of Kin Collective. So maybe you could just give us a little bit of a background on those two things. Yes, because I'm all over the place, so it's hard. <laughs> no, to you're not at all. It's con- <laughs> I think it's connected, but go ahead. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I think it's just trying to create your own path and your own future with the knowledge and things you've learned. And um, yes, my hotel wedding kind of spun off into the wedding course. And it is an online course for couples who are planning their own wedding and may not have a full service planner or someone that can take them through the process. I and my business partner have basically taken all of our knowledge, everything we've known, we've put it into this course and we basically guide couples through the process A to Z so they can have stress-free planning because everybody, you know, I've done a lot of luxury high-end events and weddings and I just think we truly believe that no matter what your wedding budget is, your background, like you deserve to have a special stress-free memorable wedding day. So we put like all of our secrets, everything we do with every one of our couples into that course and It was probably a lifeline for a lot of people this year, too, because unusual times, lots of cancellations or people downsizing and doing something different and having to figure it out on their own. So really, the timing of putting those courses online is probably very helpful. Yes, it is. It is. I think it's and understanding contracts, negotiation and with things like changing and date changes are just so much more important than ever. So there is hardly any availability. People want to get out and party and be together. And, and that's great. I think we, we crave that in person and have craved it more and more with everything that's happened over the past year. I think we see the value in being face to face and seeing each well, other. Well, 100%. And part of the reason, I mean, there's many reasons. I obviously want to talk to people around the world, but I think Before pandemic, during pandemic, and post-pandemic, I mean, I think connection, authenticity, um, doing things that matter to you have just become more and more important. And they always have been to you and I, but more important than ever, which kind of brings me to King Collective, because I think actually the timing for this is is brilliant. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, because I was very excited when I saw that pop up on my Instagram. Yes. No, thank you so much. I mean, you... You said it so well when you were like the the timing, authenticity, and trying to do something that's really true to yourself. And I think for me, um, Kin Collective really started with everything that's been happening over the past year, the amplification of Black Lives Matter and all the lives lost to police brutality and just seeing it continue and continue and continue year after year. And even in the pandemic, when we're at home, the numbers are still happening. These things are still happening. I think for me, I just sitting there, I'm like, what can I do? Like, I want to do more to bring diversity and equality and opportunities to black owned businesses and coming from hospitality and food and beverage. I mean, you've seen this in our industry too, the lack of diversity, even sometimes female, even Asian Pacific Islander, like we're supposed to be these international companies where there are hotels around the world with a lot of these companies, but you look at, you know, leadership roles, um, higher roles outside of like certain geographical locations and the diversity isn't there and the push for that. And I think after 10, 20, 10, 15 years, I don't know how many years (laughs) and hearing everything, I'm like, why am I the only face like mine that I see in the room and places and making decisions? And how do we amplify? There's so much talented so much talent out there. Like, how do we do that? And I was sitting at my table with my sister-in-law and I was just like, you know, like, I love food. We all love food. Like, let's look up, like, what is there? Like, how do you discover black owned food brands? And it really, there wasn't anybody, there isn't anybody doing that. And, and I just felt there was such this natural connection between you know, the black family, right? And reunions and food and sharing food with family at the table and introducing all of these families and people out there to amazing black owned food brands, like really high end artisanal, amazing, um, products. And so that was kind of how kin collective was born. And it's like, 
let's try it. Let's put together a beta launch. Let's do a subscription box of some amazing products that we tried everything. We ordered a ton of stuff. We tried everything. So it's completely curated and introduce the world to this because I think the only way we really start to make change. And for me, I think that's where it all started. Like I wanted to do something more. I wanted to be a part of change and growth and something bigger. And so this was this is, I think, a way that I could contribute because I know food, I know hospitality. Um, the entrepreneur in me is like, I can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but you just said it. I mean, curation and amplification, and having a platform to do that because there is so much diverse talent out there that never gets the. I don't even want to say leg up. They just don't have the opportunity where there's somebody who's in the business and has been fighting for that space in the business like yourself sees the opportunity and can bring that forth. I mean, you see this play out in all kinds of business, right? So I really am excited for you. And if I was there in Los Angeles, I would have, like I said, I've been ordering at all kinds of boxes, but I'm really excited to see the different brands that are there too, because the more you share, then the more likely I'm going to, you know, save things, put them on my list. Um, And like you said, you've tried them all. You're a trusted source, clearly. And it reminds (laughs) me, too, I don't know if you saw um, Padma Lakshmi has a a new Hulu show launched last year. It was Taste of America. I haven't watched it yet, but it's on my list. Yeah, of course, when I always go on about this, but one of the only females hosting a freaking travel or food show, that's a whole other issue that I'll get to. (laughs) But, but, um, you know, the point being that there's, all these flavors and all these people from around the world that brought all this incredible food, um, which is a huge part of the culture of anywhere, because food is the basis of culture and sharing and connection on so many levels. But in America, it really is so many different parts coming together and people either forget or they don't acknowledge or they don't know and maybe they'd be curious. Um, and I think that this just it's just another opportunity to go down the rabbit hole because you discover one person, you want to find out what else they're making and sharing that kind of thing, which is, I think, what Padma was trying to do on her show. But I think with these kinds of, I don't even want to say tasting boxes because they're not, they're really sharing a, a bunch of products, but there's a story behind them and there is a purpose behind them. And I think that's a wonderful uh, thing to see. So I'm really excited for you. Um, and just you. in terms of sourcing, is it from all over the U.S. or is it mainly California-based? All over the U.S. Like it's really – so I was um, – when we were doing this, I'm like the marketing person. Mm-hmm. So like even though I came from catering sales, I'm like, I like marketing and stories. And um, we put together an entire brochure about every product. So every box comes with a brochure that talks about – every product, every story. Um, and the stories are just so amazing. I mean, actually it's so funny. Like one of, we have this amazing jam and she was a chef at like high end hotels throughout like South Carolina and South and then moved to New York and then started this jam. And then you have a couple who started a tea company cause they wanted to show people in their community that you don't just have to drink soda. Like there are really tasty, yummy alternatives that don't contribute to like diabetes and are better for your health. And so they started it really to share that with their community. And so we were able, like we talked to every founder of the company and we're able to get their story and we put the stories together so that as you read and taste the products, like you're able to read every story and and learn about it. Cause there, there's amazing products from all over. I just, I want it all. <laughs> well, the, the, the tea aspect is a, is a really good point because again, to anybody listening, because I know that we have listeners in New York and Los Angeles, certainly in the U S but also in Canada and, and here in Europe, um, it's true because distribution is so uneven when it comes to healthy food or different choices based on different communities, which has always been the case uh, around the U.S., unfortunately. And so I've seen more of those stories with people really returning to find solutions. Um, and I think it's, it's wonderful and it's commendable. And I'm really excited to see what so many of these people are doing. Um, and I think also in terms of flavors, there's so much to, to suss out there because in California, obviously we're spoiled for choice, (laughs) the freshest produce anywhere. And it's fantastic. But to your point about that one previous chef, you have a lot of people, kind of a movement of people that went to New York or they went to San Francisco or they went to Los Angeles to, to train or, or to come up through the ranks, whether they were chefs or all those kinds of things, and then really felt a pull to return to different communities. And also they were priced out, right? So As I've done a lot of road tripping around the U.S. and you've traveled a lot, too, I've seen a big migration of people traveling back to Charleston, Nashville, New Orleans, um, having the opportunity to set up their own business, uh, to do different kinds of production, um, 
away from other big cities where they wouldn't have that opportunity. So I think, I mean, not that those are small cities, but you know what I mean. It's, <laughs> it's exciting things. And I think that level of entrepreneurism is something that's like so fundamentally American. Like, I guess I take that for granted. And then I go to other places and I realize that it's just kind of part of what people do. They, they see a, a situation or something they can address and they just do it. You're, it's so, so I really true. admire that. Yeah. I mean, I was in awe, honestly, like I thought, okay, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm putting together these boxes. Like I'm doing this <laughs> cool thing. But then I obviously like it, it kind of reminded me that like every one of these brands small, cause they're all small businesses. They're all entrepreneurs too. And yeah, like, right. and I think it's so, cause we're so new and some of them are new. Some of them like are doing good and on their way to growing, but just the inspiration I took away from talking to each one of them and each of their stories too. It's just like, yes, entrepreneur hustle. Like we're all <laughs> trying to do this. And it is, like you said, like, it's just everybody, like it, it is such a part of the American dream, right? Like you start your own business and you grow it and it becomes your life and just talk and seeing this list of people just doing it, whether they, some of them didn't get business loans. It started in their garage and small, yeah. like they weren't able, they didn't have access to those things. And one was like a mom who started home delivery service because she wanted to, um, stay home with her kids. And eventually she, one of her friends was like, well, you need to make something like prepackaged. That's easy. So she started making granola and all of yep. a sudden like, she's got this amazing granola brand, but some of it just like this entrepreneurship that comes out of like need, necessity, drive, and then grows. And it starts well, there's so always, small. There's always that saying is like, if you feel like the need to do something, you should just do it because there <laughs> is a market for it. I mean, literally there that you can find a market for it. And I was just thinking, tell me if I have this wrong, but weren't you, aren't you born and raised Angelino? Uh, yeah, just yeah. outside of LA. So I, yeah. I say yes. <laughs> so, yes, you are. So, I mean, I think part of Los Angeles is it's always, it's like the town of recreation on so many different levels where there is this kind of turnover of like opportunity and doing something new and um, building on top of another idea and another idea. And it kind of gives you, it's a town that gives you the room to do that, to be creative um, as an entrepreneur. I mean, that's always just something I saw. I felt like when I moved West after being in New York for so many years, and God knows I love New York, but I returned to the West and I felt like there was just an openness to ideas uh, of really trying things. And I'm sure that I can only imagine that you've had incredible feedback to Kin Collective, but don't you, wouldn't you say that's kind of being in Los Angeles, especially like being raised there, you've kind of seen that as part of the culture. It it has. I feel like everybody has a side hustle out here, whether they have a <laughs> corporate day job or something else. It's. I think it's the something on the side of the entrepreneurship that really satisfies a lot of people out here. So I think it is sometimes rare that yeah. you you find someone and this is they just do one thing, like they got their nine to five and that's all. Yeah. It, yeah. It is, it's rare to see that in Los Angeles. And the other thing too, is that I think people forget elsewhere what a food city Los Angeles is. I mean, you can go back to any Bourdain episode. I think he's done two in Los Angeles, just because the breadth of like multiculturalism that's in Los Angeles and the celebration of like all the flavors literally there are, are really something to behold. And that shifted. I had read some whole article about, you know, the East was always kind of a that's where you went. It was like the food snob central. But then really over the last, like, I would say seven years, it's been such a huge shift to the West Coast. And part of that certainly is produce, but it's also um, different kinds of influence from from different different countries that end up in California specifically. But it's been incredible. Even just in the five years I lived there, there was a big growth, I feel like. I'm sure you've it's seen a bigger true. difference. Yeah. It's true. And I feel like um, L.A. has gotten really good at um like I remember when my brother lived in New York I would go to New York like you'd have all these small restaurants and um you could pop in anywhere but I think LA has gotten a lot better at it used to be like these bigger chain restaurants and big restaurants but they've kind of really leaned into creating opportunities for small pop-ups for small yeah. restaurateurs so you're seeing a lot more of that which gives a lot more opportunity to not have to take on a big space with like 40, 50 tables and to be able to just like serve at a takeout window and maybe only have two or three tables, but start with a really strong like pickup and um, almost like an elevated takeout service and grow your business and, and do it in an affordable way so that you can scale up and not take on something bigger. And that's just enabled so many more people from all different backgrounds and financial levels to start restaurants and, and us to taste this amazing food. Yeah, it's really true. And then you also have the birth of places like Silver Lake, which I always call is now like Brooklyn West, oh where God, it's yeah. the smaller spaces, <laughs> like there came the restaurants and all of a sudden it was like West Coast, New York or something. But I mean... <laughs> 
I'm sure everybody's getting price out of that area too. It's been happening for a long time, but there, there are more neighborhoods to explore than ever before. I always say Los Angeles is like an umbrella, right? And then you have all these different towns under it. So if you come thinking you're going to conquer Los Angeles in one, in one go, like you're mm-hmm. dreaming, right? It's not possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so many parts to it. And I think that's what I came to really enjoy about it. The more I realized that after exploring, I was like, okay, I get it. And then there was just always something more to uncover. I mean, as a native, I'm still uncovering, (laughs) still (laughs) discovering. (laughs) Yeah. And it's changing all the time, all the time. And so speaking of that, being from Los Angeles, um, going back, what is the first trip you remember taking both as a kid and then like as an adult? Oh, that's a good question. So as a kid, um, actually my grandmother took me to London <laughs> and it was amazing. Um, it was, it was my first big trip. My grandma took each of us like on our like solo trip with her. Um, and so we went to London and we did the whole tour of like doing Buckingham palace and exploring. And we actually went to Scotland too. And I saw my first kilt and learned a lot about that. I'll never forget <laughs> the old man in the kilt being like, you know what we wear under here? Oh I'm God. Like, oh no, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh-huh. Never forget that. Never. Oh, dear. <laughs> how, how, do you, how old were you when you went there? I was there? probably like 10 or 12. That's such a nice first trip, though. I'd like to do it that was, with my my niece and nephew, take them to places later on. But that's special. It's such a special memory. I met my first pen pal back before email. I another girl. Hey, you're, you're, the first, sec- you're the letters. second person. You're the second person now on this podcast has mentioned pen pals. And I'm very jealous because I've never had any of that situation. So oh, I love that. I mean, I'm totally aging myself, I feel like, by saying I had a pen pal. <laughs> You're not. not. You're not. I love it. I think that's so sweet. Oh my goodness. We rode for a little while, but it was a great trip and such special memories to have with my grandmother for sure. Oh, and what about first trip you took like on your own or as an adult? I guess where you were paying for it. (laughs) Yeah, so that would be a backpacking trip. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) <laughs> um, let's see. One of my first, one of my first was, uh, I want to say Belize. Oh, um, nice. I did I actually went with two girlfriends and, um, we backpacked through Belize, um, and we went and saw the ruins and then we ended up on the islands because of course we're California girls and wanted ocean and sun, mm-hmm. um, hosteled it, <laughs> definitely ended up in a yep. hostel for one night. We're like, we as you do. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I have those memories um, too. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah. It was, yeah, but it was, it was a really special trip and actually one of my friends ended up falling in love on that trip and now has moved to Belize and has two kids and a husband down there and has become an island girl herself. So that was an I mean, unexpected travel adventure. That's a nice life. I mean, again, like being that proximity to to places in, in Central America and even in South America is like such a treat. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And I think it's become just even more and more popular along with Costa Rica over time, but both beautiful places. That's a good one. God, I feel like that was not that was not where I was going. So <laughs> yeah, that oh, one. It was, well, I you know, and I had friends who were just like adventurers too, and so I was like, I'm going to become an adventurer, and it really helps inspire when you're surrounded by other people who travel. Yeah, and like help you. Like I, I grew up traveling a little bit, but not to the extent of some of my friends. So I think it really pushed me to go to new places and explore. And and we did Belize and Guatemala and. It was just so, so special. And I'm, I'm so happy I did that. Well, that's, it's funny. Cause I always have a question around that. Like what pushed you to explore, but you just kind of answered that. But when, you know, when you're younger, obviously media and entertainment come a lot into play. So I always say, was there a movie or a book that inspired you to explore more? I think people, honest, I think it was friends who did it, who were just out there and exploring. Yeah, that's a good question, but no, Yeah. I'm no, such I think a person. <laughs> yeah, no, good for you. I think all I remember is being a kid and being obsessed with Indiana Jones and just thinking like, oh, why yeah. can't why can't I be Indiana Jones? Like, what? I don't want to be these other people. Like, I just want to be having random adventures around around the world. It just seemed like a good plan at the time when I was like six, and I'm still I'm still aiming for that. <laughs> I think mean, t- you can always go back to archaeology school. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would be a terrible archaeologist, but I do like the hat and I like the adventures. So on that tip, I'm. <laughs> with that. And then, you know, something else with entertainment. 
And I always feel like this is like it's got a personal memory, but I always say, was there a particular album or song that you associate with a special trip or a place? You know, I mean, on it, it's not a particular song, but like reggae, it's not, mm-hmm. but like I, I hear reggae songs and I think of Belize for some reason. Like we, we spent so many nights dancing. Yeah, out dancing of course. As you would there. Time I yeah. hear reggae, I'm taken back to like the little CD <laughs> bar. We spent so many nights dancing in just every time. And I kind of like it as it's actually, I have to say it's, I, I put it on on the plane too. I'll put on like a reggae. I'll put on Marley's like huge album playlist. And it kind of just like lulls me. Yeah. Sets into the mood. Mellowness while flying. So it's more of like yeah. the genre, I guess. Uh, well, again, like, like proximity to islands and like Central America. I mean, like I think other people in other places don't realize like that's one of the first go tos for when you're living on the West Coast or, or Hawaii. But I think more like the islands in Central America. And, and the minute you step out of the plane, just like the feeling in the air and the humidity and like everything about it, you're like just transported. So I get it. And it's been a long time um, since I've been back that way. Um, would you say... Who is a historical woman who comes to mind for you as an inspiration on seeing more, learning more, or any current ones? Yeah, okay. I'm. It's so not inventive, but I love Michelle Obama. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Come on. I know, but it's just like it's. I and I think she, she's amazing. I'm like not put, but I'm just like it's not like super unique or this. But I am just so inspired by her and everything she's done, and I um. When I listened to her book, I probably spent half of it crying because I was like, you've done so great. much. You've worked It was so great. <laughs> Anybody, and I also tell people, I mean, not to like, if you want, if you're more of a reader, fine, but the audio book is fantastic because you're listening to her. And I feel That's like anytime, yes. So anytime you have the opportunity to listen to the person who wrote it, like it just makes a huge difference because you're catching all the nuances and all this those kinds of stories. probably why I cried more. <laughs> <laughs> like it was such a struggle for you. But I think just seeing how... How I mean, you know, everybody's like, Brooke, President Obama, President Obama, but like she is such a huge force, like yep. almost more so than him because she was doing so much and is so brilliant and so smart, but so caring and poised and so many things that, I mean, I think she's has her, she has the recognition and everybody loves her and all of that. And she yeah, probably outshines rock at this point <laughs> well, but it, it is it is true I mean like and I think there's that joke where he had introduced her or something at something and was like I know you're not here to see me I think that's when yeah. she was doing her book tour and the thing about her is that she really is always brings her full true self to every situation and I think that's what people respond to so as she travels yeah. the world not just as first lady but now I just think it resonates with people and you know something I keep on talking about especially after this year is people are, again are more starved for real connection and authenticity more than ever and they can smell a fake like a mile away and she's always oh, yeah. been authentic and strong and um just an incredible ambassador really to be anywhere so we're very fortunate that that was part of a, the american history <laughs> yeah. See, oh my gosh. the next few chapters are but she was like yeah she was fantastic um yeah. Yeah, and her having, of course, a very different background than Barack. And again, if people don't know the story, obviously she's from born and raised South, Chi- South Side Chicago, whereas Barack is from Hawaii yeah. um, before he moved to so Chicago, different. which is like a night and day as well. <laughs> night and day. And I am night have, like, and day. In laws family, like my hairdresser's from the South Side of Chicago. So I love talking to him about the stories in her book. And he was like, oh, yeah, that was the high school I didn't go to. So it's kind of cool to see, like, People, like a lot of people come from the south side of Chicago and yeah. um, there's a lot of them out here who have moved out here and talking to him about like the school she went to and the, the oh yeah this was this school and that gang or this crew and like hearing kind of hearing it come to life even more is really is well really it's actually re- it's relatable right she's never yeah. pretended to be anything she's always just been herself so having yeah. those conversations and really um you know again talking about the community and something I was saying on this show is that When we talk about seeing things through the lens of travel and culture, I'm not necessarily meaning like, oh, I went on a trip all across the world and like it changed my life. Like, of course, that would happen. But (laughs) sometimes you have those those cultural experiences that can be everyday experiences in your neighborhood or the guy down the street that you had a regular conversation with that like impacted your whole life. Like those things really add up. So that's That's just as much of a cultural impact. And I think, too, even though Americans matriculate a lot and tend to move like multiple times in their life. 
um, for the most part. I would say part of the country does not, and then some do just between. I was trying to explain this recently. I'm like, yeah, yeah, Americans go, maybe they leave for college, and then they go somewhere else for their first job, and then they maybe change for another job later, and then they, you know, it's like you could live in average of like three to four cities easily, um, just because there's so many options and it's so, so big. But um, those, those things in your neighborhood really come to matter, and you hear people exchanging stories. I hear it in Los Angeles a lot, because people like to flex about, like, where they're from, which I think yeah. is really funny. So as an Angelino, you're probably like, oh, God, I'm hearing this all the time. But I see that play out, and I think it's because people feel like kind of a pang for, for where they came from, just whether it's a familiar, like, block or smell or sight or something like that. And it, it impacts them more than they realize until they're older, yeah. um, which is the truth of the matter. It's a sense of pride too, I think. Like even yeah. if you move to the West Coast or a different coast, you still have that, well, this is where I'm from and Yeah, oh hundred percent. God knows it plays out in our sports, but <laughs> 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 I was gonna say on that level then, what foreign cultural experience made the largest impact on you? And that could be mm-hmm. near or far. Um traveling to Morocco. That was oh, just yeah. a far outside my culture, my um where I had been, what I had known. It was an amazing, amazing and special trip. I went with a girlfriend of mine again. One day I need a solo trip. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. But the, yeah, we, we can talk all about it. That's pretty much the only way I travel. So we can exchange tips. <laughs> I would love it. One, one day I'm going to do that. It's on the list. I, I need to do that for myself. Um, ditch the family. <laughs> to a solo trip. But um, yeah, Morocco was amazing, but it it definitely was a lot of lessons in um, culture and different cultures. And I think um, we're very respectful people and we went there fully being respectful with like arms covered, wearing pants, like um, in certain areas we covered our hair just to be like when we were in smaller villages. But um, just learning a lot. Like I think we got lost actually um, Mm -hmm. trying to find our first hostel in Marrakesh and we weren't, we didn't really understand, but we, we asked and my, our French is pretty good. I took French in school and it actually came in very handy. One of the few (laughs) times in my life living in California where my French came in handy. (laughs) And um, we asked for directions to these like preteen teenage boys and they took us there and then they wanted money. And I guess we gave them a little, but they kept banging on the door of the hostel asking for more money, more money. Like it was actually a little, a little scary um, because that wasn't something we knew. And the hostel owner was there and he let us in and he actually yelled at the kids, like, get out of here, like, go away. But he, he educated us, you know, this is a place in a culture where if you need directions, you need to ask small children or women, like don't ask men, don't ask young boys, teenage boys. And, um, that was a very, like, a different cultural thing because you're thinking, like, oh, pre-T, like, yeah, they'll just, like, tell me where to go and not a big deal. But it actually was a big deal sure. <laughs> and something we learned. I mean, it was a great lesson. And I'm happy we learned it early on. So then from then on, we kind of knew how to ask for directions and who to ask for help and well, there's um, all those there's all those layers, right? And I find that so when you there. when you travel around other countries internationally, it's like the big things we all have in common in terms of like wanting our family to be safe and sharing a good meal and a laugh and all that. But it's all the small customs that really add up to a larger um, sociological behavior and and what's just kind of accepted and as is. Which is, I mean, it's the same. It's even the same me being outside of the states right now looking in, or you know, with anywhere else. There's all those kinds of different nuances and. Yeah, it can be a sharp learning curve sometimes because sometimes yeah. even if you think you're prepared and you're trying, you're, you're never going to know everything. You know, you just kind of have to take it as, as you go and hopefully don't get into too much, too much trouble. But I mean, also, it's funny because I was going to say the next question, which ties into your King Collective, was what was the greatest culinary experience you had in another country? And I was just thinking Morocco has fantastic food as well. Oh, but gosh. Go on. Such I'm sure you, I'm sure you've got a good one at the tip of your tongue. Oh, <laughs> Bali. Yes, I think, um, well, because I'm a vegetarian, too. So, um, I mean, can find food all around the world, which I love. Sometimes it's easier to find food around the world than it used to be in the South. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But Bali, we just, oh, my gosh, I feasted on food there. And they, so I'm a tempeh lover, and tempeh originated in Bali, and it's like a fermented, um, like, protein supplement and it it's just like and their tofu and their food was just so cheap 
and so flavorful and melt in your mouth and just full of like love and flavor and goodness. I just, I want to go back. I'm with with you. But I want to go back for the food. (laughs) Yeah, no, 100%. I was there for a stretch of time and like a long time ago, my God, like 2005. But I just remember every single thing I had there, you know, it was just all so fresh and nothing was, nothing was full of all these weird adjectives. But even better additives, sorry, I can't even speak today, even better (laughs) than other places. And I just, that that do a good job at it. And it really speaks to island life. Um, I was going to say, certainly like Indonesia has like really good cooking too, but of course Bali is like kind of a separate little place within Indonesia, but I like Indonesian curries and stuff as well because of, of their heavy use of coconut base and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, now I'm just getting hungry thinking about it. I but know. Yeah, it's wonderful. I'm like, where can I find Balinese food in LA? <laughs> Actually, I need to really look and see. I wonder if there is some good one, but I just... That's a really oh, good question. So I don't good. think you see like Indonesian food, but I've never seen anything. And whoever is listening, correct us or give us a shout out. If you know something that we don't, whether it's in Los Angeles or London, just tell us because I've never seen anything like that personally. Yeah. But that's interesting. It was um, so good. It really was. This is now. This isn't meant to be a negative question. I always preface this, but I, I think it's just important. Is is there a destination that pleasantly surprised you or thrilled you the most that maybe wasn't expected to? I've been to London and France and Italy, and then um, with one of my old roommates, we went to Spain. And mm. I kind of been like, okay, I've been to Europe, like cool, like let's go to Spain. It'll be good food. And I just honestly, too, to be like, I, I hadn't really researched it or care. Like he planned it all. And I'm like, I'll come along for the ride. So I just didn't really think much. I'm like, I'm just, this is going to be awesome. Yeah. Let's go to Spain. But I was just like, wow. Like we went to Barcelona and I'm just like, I, it's fantastic. I want to go back. Like seeing <laughs> like Cody and the food. God, God, did I say it wrong? Um, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's, 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 it's- Fantastic. And the funny thing about you saying that is A, I'm part of my heritage is Spanish, but yes. B, um, <laughs> but B, I actually just booked a trip to return there in August. And it so times nice. with something that reminds me of California, which is um, in Santa Barbara every year they have Fiesta Week. And for people that don't know it, I mean, obviously the entire Southwest had belonged to Mexico at one point, which was then controlled primarily by the Spanish who came and took out a bunch of land and did a bunch of bad stuff. Sorry, but they came in there. And, <laughs> and Santa Barbara is a stunning city, and it's built with a kind of, with a colonial, a Spanish colonial style. And so yep. every year, it's like, they've been doing it for like 100 years. It's like a nod to the heritage that built that town. Um, and it's incredible. I mean, the, the whole city is just like dances and the, the best like um, horse performers come in from all over the state, and it's incredible food. Um, mm. and on, on hot on that heels, I just listened to some podcast interviews with Jose Andreas, who's of course like the greatest, mm-hmm. not just chef, but humanitarian. And once he gets started on, on Spanish food, like, oh my God, it just makes <laughs> you want to like book a trip the next day. But I think it's a phenomenal, phenomenal country. And there's so many different parts to it where like the North and South are so different and like Madrid and Barcelona feel so different. And it's just, yeah, it really is. I think. Just what you said. I think people go there being like, oh, it's going to be Spain. It's part of Europe. It's so cool. And then you go and it's just like another level. It's so unique. And I, I mean, we were only in um, Barcelona and then we went down to the coast to Sitges mm. but, um, for the beach. But I didn't even make it to Madrid. And that is definitely I, I, I need to go back to because it was just it's just special, unique place to go and visit and so much fun so many good memories and so much good food <laughs> it really is and it's funny because you know right now when we're recording this there's obviously still rules in europe about who can go where and for the uk there's greenless country and non-greenless countries and spain and the uk have a very significant relationship because a lot of people in the uk own property there or spend a big chunk of the year there and so right now um the, it's they're like amber list and so there's kind of different quarantine rules on both sides but the islands are now on the green list which is like Majorca and like oh. Visa and all these places but of course they're like beautiful beautiful places but when you want go to go to Spain you kind of want to go to the mainland because that's really where you're going to get the most cultural touch points that said I would not turn down going to any of those places tomorrow I'm like, I could go to Majorca for a party or two that's okay oh my god it's so fantastic well it's funny so this next question I feel like you have an unfair advantage because you did grow up in Los Angeles, but 
you know, I was saying how local experiences can expand global knowledge. So any favorites in, in Los Angeles growing up? Like, like was there a favorite place you liked, whether it was a, a place you ate or a museum or something that just kind of expanded your, your worldview, like, as an experience in Los Angeles? That is a good one. I mean, I think just growing up in, like, such a diverse and, like, multicultural environment and having access. It's interesting, like, I was on a call the other day, and um, it was, like, a big group call, and people talked about, like, their favorite food or this, and, and people were from all over the U.S., and one of the people was like, it was Thai food. I didn't have it till I was, like, 40 years old because it wasn't anywhere where I lived, and I'm like, what? Like, yeah. you didn't have Thai food till you were 40? <laughs> like, and I think... Yeah, yeah. So, like being here, like just eating like Thai food and Indian food, soul food, like just having access to so many different types of like cultural foods and things to try and like and museums and all of that are just um it's I really, know it really is an unfair advantage. I remember when I was <laughs> first in New York and I would see like groups of little kids in the Met and I was just filled with with envy for never having that experience growing up. And I see that in Los Angeles. And it's true because now like the diversity of food is kind of spread across like really all over America. But again, just the wealth of different experiences in a city like Los Angeles is really, really hard to compete with elsewhere. And so you kind of it's kind of fun seeing people discover what are other kinds of international foods that they love, even if they haven't really left, you know, their pocket. Yeah. But um, I was just thinking how, what a sad thing when people go to like Epcot Center or whatever at Disney World and, you know, you can eat like at the different, what is it? There's the different restaurants from around the world. I'm like, that can't be your only experience. <laughs> you came there as a kid from like New York or Los Angeles. You'd almost be like, what is this? What? This doesn't even taste like it's supposed to taste like you. He would know the difference. You wouldn't. But I, think- I remember one of, um, I, I've lived by this rule every time I travel, like even within the U.S. is, um, and my friend started it and I took it from her was um, never eat chains. Like, when you are yeah. traveling, you are never allowed to eat from a chain. You should always be trying a local business or um, not anything but a chain. No Starbucks. <laughs> None of that. No and Starbucks. I love that. I love living by that. Even like whether it's international, it's local, anything, I, I do live by well, that. Well, plus other people need the tourism dollars. God knows the chains don't need it. So like, I what's mean, the point? And that too. And clearly like you've traveled a lot. But it sounds like you've traveled a lot with like somebody else or with friends to the most part. Yeah, it'll be like one friend or a couple of friends or um, I think because I like I said, like I I really do have a, a cool community where they're like of girlfriends and people in my life who are like so game to like travel and go places. So it's like, yeah, maybe even if I wanted to be solo and one of them heard like, wait, you're going, I'm going to come. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come anyway. <laughs> Uh, well, that's, listen, that's a good group of friends to have. But when you travel, do you have like any routine or certain priorities when you travel to a new place? Uh, I mean, part of it's the no chains, but um, eat, really just eating and trying to just like meet people and immerse, like not, not necessarily just going to like the touristy places, kind of like staying away from that and trying yeah. to really just meet people. I think, um, I, I do, I have to give credit to my husband on this sometimes because we, we, when we went to Japan, I was actually there for work, unfortunately. So I didn't get to have as much fun as he did, but he, um, practices jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu, and we'll do it no matter where we go, like go oh, to wow. New Orleans, he'll drop in. We went to Japan, he found classes, but I, I, I love and respect that because it's already a built-in community yeah. of, of people who, like, there's a mutual respect and not going. So he would drop into these classes and he'd walk away with, like, okay, we need to eat dinner here. We need to go here. We need to do this. We need. So he would get all the local That's stuff That's smart, though. Yeah. Because you, you already have a connection. Mm-hmm. But he would get all of that. And I and and so I guess I appreciate traveling with him now because of that. <laughs> no, but I think that what's so great about that is it's genuine. Like, yeah. and again, I mean, it's harder. And I get that, like, listen, there's I'm not going to shoot myself mm-hmm. in the foot here. There's amazing concierge all over the world, for sure. In certain for cities, us. they're better than others. But I generally think that when you're in somewhere new like that, especially in Japan, it's like you're you're much better speaking to peers or people that are yep. in, in, like you said, different groups that are really going to give you, like, they're not giving you the answer you kind of want to hear. Yep. They're giving you 
something. Sorry, I was doing air quotes for anybody. To see no, that, but they're, I mean, they're giving you where, where you should go or where they go, which is honestly where you would want to at the end of the day. I do have a story for that. Um, yes. I, I will not use any names and stuff. So hopefully it works out. But so when I was at this, this program, um, a couple of higher ups from the corporate company I was working for were there too, like very high up people. And, um, you know, I was that my husband happened to travel with me this time and we're talkers and we're like meeting people and we're sitting at the bar and we're chatting with the local bartender, actually both bartenders, the bartender working there who was from Spain, as well as the local from um, Kyoto. And we just like having a blast, like drinking. And they're like, yeah, he's like, my bar's here. And it's this little spot. You guys should come through, check it out. And we're like, totally. Yeah, for sure. And so he's like, I'm doing a special thing this night. So we ended up, um, of course we went, we're like, okay, we're going. So we go and we take these executives with us and we end up like in taxis bouncing around. We end up at a really great dinner and then we bounce off to this guy's bar and it's the size of like, I don't know, like a New York kitchen apartment, like (laughs) teeny tiny, right? It's like, I'm like, how do I put this into visual? Like New York kitchen apartment in Manhattan, right? That's like on budget. (laughs) And so it's teeny tiny, but there's like things hanging from the ceiling. He's like, has a little kitchen and he's doing sugar and almost looking like cotton candy things, making drinks. He's got old school playing, like it was so freaking cool. Probably even too cool for me. No, it's great. It was so <laughs> cool. And these execs were just like, this was like the funnest night. You know, like every time I go to these hotels, like I talk to, and we love the concierge, but they give them like this templated thing. And it's not like the young hip see the city outside of the box experience. And that right. night we took them on, well, this is what we do when we're trying to like figure out the local scene and do something cool and fun. And um, so they were really appreciative. So Are you kidding? You probably you gave them like the thrill of their night. And here's the thing. It's like when you're traveling mm-hmm. around so much for business, you almost forget because you get in a routine and you actually don't explore. So I think mm-hmm. something that's always been missed from a lot of travel coverage, travel media, certainly from like travel hotel, like advertising and stuff is really celebrating the community itself. Like those are the stories you want to hear about, right? Like where, yeah. Um, you, of course, you're not going to get all the cool nuances. That's going to come through that kind of connection like your husband found. That's amazing. Um, but, you know, I would I would hope that more people will seek out those kinds of experiences. And I, I understand that for some people it's outside of the comfort zone, but then that's the point, right? Yeah. It's like it's it's being able to step into that. Um, yeah. And I know when I get questions about places I've lived, because I've lived in a lot of cities at this point, I'm really mm-hmm. excited to share some, some in, input. And everybody's different. But like mm-hmm. that's, of course, when you're in Japan, who doesn't want an experience like that? And, and those people probably never would have been able to have an experience like that because um, they weren't, again, going to places and meeting with locals in that same way. It makes it So different. I love that. Yeah, yeah it does. Makes, what you say makes you kind of think of um, like Jonathan Gold, you, who you know. Yes, me, yeah. Like, and he literally, like, I think I remember hearing a story about him and one day he just like, drove down Olympic, some main street in LA and literally like would stop at every restaurant, like over the course of, I don't know how many years and eat at every single place. And which is like hundreds, if not thousands of places, but just giving the time and opportunity to try everything. And I think he was so known for not just reviewing like the flashy new, like fancy restaurants, yeah. but finding these mom and pop places. And he really, really cha- he changed the game. For people that are listening to this that don't know who he is, um, he's unfortunately no longer with us. We had back-to-back losses Mm -hmm. between Jonathan Gold and Bourdain in the span of, I think, a year. And um, Jonathan Gold was like the top food writer for the LA Times for a very long time. And there was like annual awards under his name. But the thing, as Lauren was saying, that made him so genius is that he wasn't about like, hot re- this hot restaurant this he couldn't care less like he just wanted to have good food so he literally like he would give five star reviews to a mom and pop restaurant in a mall just because they it was like an authentic dish that like couldn't be found anywhere else and it was amazing and to this day I actually had a craving for something that's a, a New Mexican dish because my mom used to make a lot of stuff from there and it wasn't easy to find at the time and when he was still alive, I had tweeted at him looking for something. And he literally replied to me and told me the one place in Los Angeles I could find it that did a good oh. job. 
<laughs> Where is it? I want to know the name of the plate. I know. I'm going to find it now. It was a particular type of sopapillas, which is not the typical ones that they make in Mexico or uh, wasn't a savory one. It was more like a dessert dish. But yeah, I still have it. I kept that tweet. It was a special thing. But if anybody, yeah. his do- the documentary that he did was fantastic. And I'm trying to remember the name now, but it was lovely. And I highly recommend you can watch it on like Amazon or something, but I highly recommend people watch it in terms of like really caring and connecting to culture and really, again, talking yep. about local exploration, right? It's so incredible. So yep. on that note, then, what would you say greatest lessons from traveling or through shared cultural experiences that you now apply to your life? Uh, that's a good one. I would say it's always being open and receiving to everything. Yep. I mean, whether I'm here in the States or in L.A., Or traveling somewhere, you know, everybody comes from different places, different backgrounds, has a different experience, a different life experience, past and things that have formed who they are or what they've gone through. And so just always being open to that and remembering that. Yeah, it's really, it's kind of crazy to me that, again, when I'm talking about connecting to the community, I think there's nothing worse where people say they want to travel. And I know lots of people that do this. But really, it's just going to the same place and having the exact same experience and not like leaving a bubble. And I'm like, well, what was the point? You just flew like a thousand miles to do the exact same thing. (laughs) Yeah. So and then you really don't learn or you don't grow from that experience. So I hope that I don't know. I just I think that people will seek that more than ever. And I feel like people are more curious more than ever, certainly the younger generation. So I think we'll see a lot more of that, um, aside from people connecting online, which has clearly gone on all year, um, <laughs> but, but just other ways in, in person. So I think people might be more willing to take, I don't want to say chances, just taking the opportunity to, to talk to new people. And it is a good point to stay open because I think people stayed so closed off, but you're going to see probably the complete opposite where people just want to like <laughs> strike up conversations and <laughs> And and try something new just because they can. My question to you then will be, what would you tell your younger self about adventuring or learning from others around the world? Especially other women. Do it more. Get out and adventure more. Do more of it. I wish I did some and I'm, I'm so happy I have done as much as I have done, but I could do more. Like as you're young, especially when, I mean, who knows what your life path will be, right? Like we never know. Like, no. You don't know your life path, but you know your present and your now. So find time to get out, adventure, explore, and and don't stop. And there's so many ways to do it. Like whether you're backpacking and staying in questionable hostels. (laughs) And I've stayed in some amazing hostels where I'm like, this is awesome. I don't want to leave. Like let yourself have the opportunity to do that. Take, take, I mean, as Americans, we're horrible at taking vacation time and stuff and take that time, take a gap year for goodness sakes, if you can, especially with everything that's gone on, like just give yourself I know. Yourself I don't know why, you know, originally, like I grew up, the first part of my life was in Canada. And so that was quite common to do a gap year as it is in a lot yeah. of places in Europe. And then my American counterparts, that was just like not a thing. And now I think people are really re-questioning their time. Right. And mm-hmm. things like that. But, um, I was just thinking something you said about vacation <laughs> is that was, this is true. There are a lot of articles. I'm not saying anything out of the ordinary here, but Americans are, are known to kind of work to death for the wrong reason yeah. and not taking vacation is very unhealthy. And after working in the States for 20 years and coming here to the UK, I literally had to be reminded to put in for my vacation, which then made me stop and question some things <laughs> being like, oh, yeah, I guess I should re- really reassess <laughs> Making these kind of putting these plans in place. And also as a reminder to people, like, you know, if you're like a teen living at home and like you're not going anywhere anytime soon, there's definitely something in your town you've never been. There's definitely a kind of food you've never had. There's definitely a museum exhibit to see something like that's from somewhere else you haven't seen. So there's just so many opportunities and like endless classes online. God knows I feel like I've done a trillion of them this year. But there's just (laughs) so many different things you can do to go down that rabbit hole and really propel you to learning or exploring something new. So I think 100 percent. What would you like to see more of? Yeah, probably more of, you know, like in media and advertising. Yep. Or just. Yeah, Yeah, media or advertising. I mean, I think I'm using travel as an example because I think women are cultural storytellers and yet they're not, especially in spaces where they have the spending power, um, which is highly a big part of travel or events and stuff. And we don't see that reflected. I think like more 
so with okay so in travel and all that too i'd say like more amplification of these voices and brands i mean i feel like i follow some instagram accounts and they'll be like you know shout out to like these these companies doing travel and stuff but like i think it's so hard to dig and find these um people to follow and these brands like there was one of like a black family traveler I'm like dude they're going around the world like they are doing it and it's like <laughs> yeah why don't they have a show they're like this beautiful family and they have this huge blog of like how to travel affordably around the world and the value they felt on travel and sharing that with their family and their two kids and I'm like wow it took me this long to find their account like why yep. Yep. aren't they written up like more why don't they get pieces and I mean I, I will I'll just going back to kind of like Kin Collective and food is I think when we started researching companies for the subscription box, I, you know, I'm Googling like black owned food and beverage brands and I'm starting my search and I'm starting the very like surface level. Let's like start initially the low hanging fruit. But what I found is that a lot of these like New York Times, Bon Appetit, all of these like were like, I guess, giving lip service to these brands because yeah. you oh, start yeah. to see the same brands on these lists like like they're all recognizing the same thing so they're either all copying each other and what others have published or they aren't digging very deep because there is way more to offer and I I think that's I guess that's kind of my answer to the question is I like media and advertisers and buyers to to dig deeper because there is just so much more out there and I feel like we're just hitting the surface level and maybe like you're playing like due diligence diversity, but there's so much more than just that initial, like, we're diverse, we're showing different, like, there is so much more. Of oh, yeah. I mean, I, th- I can't even, like, I would say a thousand percent, but that's not even, like, scratching how much I'm, like, nodding here right now, because <laughs> it, it's, and, and to your point, being very specific, you were saying the black family that you found, I mean, there is something to be said about, like, messed up algorithms and stuff that, right, and different content mm-hmm. being rewarded that shouldn't necessarily be, and that's why you see great companies like Travel Noir, who's done a, an incredible yeah. platform and Love is really it. building up um, around like black travelers and uh, talking about a lot of nuanced stories and like in safety and then all this other stuff that is so key and important that it's just not anywhere else. And again, I'm going to mention the um, Women Who Travel podcast because uh, kind of it, with the Black Lives Matter protests last year um, across America and also kind of the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of conversation with like, okay, well, what is the change going to be because it's one thing to say we need change but then like a year later they just did like a year later review and it was almost no change on the dial in terms of brands or people that wanted to do stuff with them and it's still nowhere to be seen so I can think of like at least five influencers that I just love I mean certainly um the catch me if you can um spirited pursuit who's based I think in northern Africa and oh my god her photos are incredible I think she's American and had moved there. But there's just so many incredible influencers, and maybe you and I, because I'm going to put show notes and everything, can kind of come up with some of our favorites and just try to like highlight other platforms um, in general because for sure it's really getting missed out on. And I, I think sometimes going back to the full circle moment, to the beginning about curation, it's like is what you're taking in every day truly a reflection of like where you're living? And, and how you're living, because there has to be a conscious decision about, well, this actually doesn't look reflective of anything that I'm seeing day to day that I enjoy. And really, it does take, like you said, sadly, work and effort to find this stuff. So how do we make these platforms and these people more accessible? And there's certainly yep. people doing it from Kin Collective to, again, Travel Noir to these different platforms, but it's not enough. So yeah. um, if people work in things that are based on different cultures and diversity, so that could be travel and food, then they should be 100% celebrating that full factor. And we're not seeing that no matter what people say to any scale that we need to yet. Yeah, we keep, we keep working on it. We're going to keep on. So my goal with this podcast is to start like just highlighting as many things as possible that aren't part of the norm, because I feel like the same things get tossed around or the same names get tossed around. And there's just yeah. so much more. Yeah, so. I agree. I agree. It's like you said, dig deeper on like the restaurants, the culture, the different, like all of it. Like it's, it's, we can go much, much deeper. Oh my God. Can we ever? So <laughs> because we're right here, start of summer, it's the last question. So you're heading to your next dream destination, wherever that is. Here's your three questions. What is your theme song? What's one book you're bringing? And what is one luxury item that you're bringing? I will be listening to Beyonce's Brown Skin Girl, because that mm-hmm. song just gives me all the feels. What 
book will I be reading? You know, I feel like I need to read Barack Obama's books. I haven't read any of them, so I think I'm going to start with the first one. <laughs> Michelle's so book took that. priority. That it, it's did. It, it really <laughs> did. It really did. So now I feel like I need to give him some like credit in life and read one of his books. <laughs> and my luxury item would be my Bose noise canceling headphones because I find okay. they make flying so much easier for me because I get a little anxious sometimes flying. But yeah. if, I, if I put on the noise canceling and I got some good music and a or a good show, I feel like I'm still in my living room or something. It's Listen, those, that is a good expenditure. It is a good expenditure, as is signing up for Kin Collective, which there will be <laughs> the link in the notes. So if you're living anywhere in the United States, right? Correct? They yep. can sign up for the Kin Collective. Yes. Perfect. And anything else you want to share before we sign off? Obviously, Kin Collective. And where can they find your um, hotel, the event videos? Wedding videos. WeddingCourse.com. WeddingCourse.com. You heard it, people, because I know that there's a lot of you out there that are going to be wanting to rebook a whole <laughs> bunch of things um, right through to the end of the year. So I'm so glad you, you joined me today. It was really nice Thank talking you. with you and seeing you in person, even if everybody else can't, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. This was such a pleasure. Thank you, Karen.